just a few words about me. I work as a competitive data scientist for H2O. H2O is a company that primarily creates software in the predictive analytics space and machine learning. So my main job is to make them, well, as predictive as, as possible. Uh, I've done my PhD in machine learning in the University College London. My focus was in ensemble methods, as in how we can combine all the different algorithms available out there in order to get um, a stronger, a better prediction. And I'm not sure if, if people have heard about Kaggle, but um, Kaggle is, is the world's biggest predictive modeling platform where different companies would post different um, data challenges and they will ask data scientists to solve them. And there is a league, there is a ranking for those who are able to solve this best. So at some point, I've won multiple competitions. I was able to get to the top spot there out of, I don't know, half a million uh, data scientists. But the, what I take away from this is that I have been able to participate a lot in different challenges, see all the different problems companies have uh, in this machine learning space and be able to incorporate back at least some of it uh, into our, our products and make them more efficient and more predictive. Uh, as this was mentioned before, H2O's goal is to democratize AI, is to, to make certain that people can use and get and leverage the benefits um, of AI without thinking that it is so difficult uh, in order to enter that field. Um, we have a very, and, and we are very proud that we have a very big community, primarily the, uh, empowered by our open source community. Um, we have uh, around 200,000 data scientists using, using our products and uh, some major uh, organizations and banks are using it. Um, in general, we, I would say we have two main products. Um, we have the, uh, the open source suite of products where uh, we have the main H2O library, which is uh, available in uh, different programming languages like Python, R, Java, and it contains many machine learning algorithms and applications in a distributed manner. Uh, then we've taken this and we've put it into, um, we try to make it more efficient to work in a Spark environment, and we call that sparkling water. And then we also we have a version which is a bit more optimized for, uh, for GPU. But what I will be more focusing today is this tool we have called um, driverless AI, where it tries to automate many steps in the machine learning process, trying to give you uh, a good result fairly quickly. And I will go into deeper about what this specific product does. Um, using this tool, we have had some success in this competitive environment I mentioned before. Kaggle, not sure why the slide moves so quickly. Um, for example, there was this competition hosted by PNP Baribas where um, Driverless was able to get top 10 out of 3,000 teams um, within two hours. And I know that was super hard because I also participated and it took me around two weeks, uh, maybe three weeks to get near where driverless AI was able to get within two hours. So that, that, that's an idea that can give you um, what you can do, how much predictive power you can get uh, by using a tool like driverless AI. Um, uh, generally, the typical workflow when you try to work on a data science problem um, in general terms quite often looks like the one on the screen where you, you normally have a data integration phase which is uh, essentially you try to gather to collect all your data from different data sources, maybe different tables, different uh, SQL uh, databases and you try to put it together after doing multiple joins into one tabular file Whereas it is, let's say, in one line, is every sample, every row in that data set is, let's say, one customer. Um, and 
then normally starts a very, very iterative process from a, a machine learning point of view or a data science point of view where you try to do multiple experimentations, playing with different algorithms, playing with uh, after defining different validation strategies, um, where you keep seeing what kind of results you get and keep reiterating until you improve on this problem uh, and get the best results possible. And this is where driverless AI is primarily sits. So once you have that data set, which you have some properties that you would like to predict and build algorithms based on, this is where driverless takes over um, it will use multiple machine learning applications in order to be able to get um, best results possible given some constraints. In order to be a bit more specific, the way it would work is once you have that tabular data set, you can imagine something in, in an Excel format, then you normally have a target variable, something that you try to, to predict out of this data set. For example, will someone can I predict somebody's age based on some characteristics, or can I, pre which is a regression problem, or can I predict if someone will default on his or her loan um, given some past uh, credit history data, uh, which is essentially a binary classification problem. So driverless can handle multiple ty different types of what we call supervised problems. The next thing that you need to do is to define uh, an objective, a measure of success. So do I want to maximize a form of accuracy or do I want to minimize a form of error? There are various different objectives you can specify to make your model focus in specific areas. And then you allocate some resources. Obviously, you're bound to the hardware you're running uh, driverless on, but also you have the ability to, to, to control how much intensity the software puts on maximizing accuracy and how much time is spent on doing that. So you can always make uh, accuracy also a function of time. If you don't have much time, um, you, can, you can essentially say to driverless, uh, try to do the best what you can quickly. Uh, or if you had a lot of time, normally drivers can get uh, higher accuracy. So by controlling um, accuracy and given the hardware limitations and how much time you have available, then driverless will use all this mix in order to start giving you some outputs. So those outputs come in multiple forms. It could be um, some insights, general insights and visualizations. It will be what we call feature engineering. So when you normally put some data, most machine learning algorithms prefer the data in, in a certain format, and I will explain later more about this, but you also have the option to, uh, through driverless, extract this transformed view of the data that can maximize your accuracy and try your own algorithms, for example, on it. You can also get the predictions for your problem um, based on the algorithms that we use. Um, and there is also a module called machine learning interpretability where it, it becomes increasingly more important uh, as it promotes accountability and essentially says, um, is the process of trying to explain how a model makes predictions in humanly readable terms? Can I understand how my black box model uh, works in simple terms? Um, it, it is a very important area. There is a lot of focus um, in order to make certain that businesses can, can trust AI um, in today's uh, world. Um, so. Uh, our visualization, uh, we have a great guy behind it, Lila Wilkinson. He has written the grammar of graphics. He was one of the first people within Tableau. And he has built a really clever automated visualization process, uh, which consists of several algorithms that they scan through your data and they try to find interesting patterns. And as I said, before I highlight it again, this process is purely automated. So it will not search for everything. It will, uh, it will not, sorry, 
it, it, it will actually search for everything, but it will not show you everything. It will show you only patterns from within the data which are important. For example, we have some graphs that focus on outliers. So it will focus on showcasing to you and highlighting um, features within your data which contain outliers and pinpoint them uh, so that you're able to, uh, to see them and determine um, what, whether you want them in or not, whether they are mistakes or just extreme cases. Um, other graphs focus on correlations and clusterings within your data. Others could be heat maps. Um, generally, it's, it's, it's a comprehensive and, and detailed process which is uh, completely automated and focuses to give you a quick insight about your data automatically. So if you don't know how to look on what to search for, this visualization uh, process can find out some quick uh, good patterns in order to give you a general insight about what your data is about. Um, and now I'm moving on to the other phase that actually driverless AI spends quite some time because from also my experience, most of the predictive powers is within your features. And how you transform them is very important and critical in order to be able to get uh, good results. Let me give you an example. You have a feature in your data um, where you, it's called animal, it takes different distinct values like dog, cat, and fish. Let's say you have a target where you try to predict cost. Uh, and this is just one of your input features. Um, there are multiple ways to represent this variable. Most algorithms tend to understand numbers. They don't understand letters. Even if you use, even some, some applications use letters, in reality, they use a numerical representation under the hood. So one way to transform it could be to use something called frequency encoding where you just count how many times dog or cat appears in your data and you replace with this. Then you have a variable that says how popular its animal is. Or you could use something which is more uh, quick, it's called label encoding, where you just sort all the unique values of the animal and incrementally you assign a unique index. Or you could use something called dummy coding or one-hot encoding where you treat each one of the distinct categories of animal as a, as a binary feature. So is it a dog? Yes or no. <clears throat> is it a cat? Yes or no. Um, something else you can do, as I mentioned before, so since you try to predict cost, essentially it's, it's your target variable, what you could do is estimate the average cost from your, um, from your uh, categories, in this case the animals, and just create a feature that maps this. So you already has a feature that um, maps the target. And quite often, especially if you have lots of categories, this kind of representation can really help algorithms to convert to a good result more, more quickly. And there are many different flavors of all these transformations. I'm just showing you on a high level what are the different transformations we might consider? And we always search from, for the best ones. And the answer is not always clear. Sometimes you really need to go through in order to all of them in order to be able to find which one works best. Other type of transformations we might consider is imagine you have a continuous variable, age, and let's say you try to predict income. So. Uh, this is quite often not a very straightforward relationship. And by this I mean when you are young your income is low and then it increases by quite a fast pace. When you reach middle age, uh, you know, slowly the income starts in sti are still increasing but at a lower pace. And then once you go towards retirement, income starts decreasing. So there are shifts in the relationship between your input feature and what you try to predict, which is income. So being able to spot this and create some features where they specifically point to these um, changes in relationship, for example, through binning, by transforming the numerical feature to categorical, say that um, instead of having a numerical feature, say, this is the band that falls from this age to this age. Normally, you can really help some algorithms to drive uh, better performance. 
Um, other form of transformations could be how you replace missing value. You could use the mean, the mon, or the mod, or, or the median. Um, or you could just treat it as a different category in a categorical context. And there are other transformations you can consider too, like dating the logarithm or square root of a numerical feature. Sometimes this form of scalings can help to minimize the impact of extreme values and help some algorithms converge faster and give you better results. Um, other type of features we are considering is uh, interactions among features. Can we, create, can we create one more focused and more powerful feature by, by combining two together? For example, we could multiply or add two features and other form of mathematical operations. Or if we have two categorical features, we might just concatenate them at one single string. Or if we have a numerical and a categorical um, feature, we can explore interactions in the form of group by statement. Can estimate the average age of a dog, cat in this case. And you just create a variable that um, showcases this. And you don't need to limit yourself to only averages, it could be maximum value, standard deviations, uh, any form of descriptive statistic can, can go here. Or you could even bin it through the technique I showed you before, create those bands, convert it to categorical, and then use this, uh, the concatenation technique in order to make it as one bigger string. Uh, similarly, uh, Text has its own way of being represented in order to get the most uh, when you use it with some machine learning algorithms. Something that quite often we will do is um, out of all the possible words that you have in your data, so in all your rows, you might have a, a field which is called description. What we are doing is essentially we are tokenizing, so we are breaking down each word into a single um, uh, feature, a single variable, essentially. And then we say how many times each word appears in each row out of all the possible words. So we call that the term frequency matrix, which it has different, uh, it, can, it can come with different versions and flavors, but that's the basic I idea that some words are very indicative about the context uh, of what the sentence uh, tries to say. Uh, and there are other techniques as well. Uh, obviously, there are ways to pre-process the text. Uh, was, for example, applying stemming, which is removing the suffixes from words. It's like you might have playing, but the core of the word is play. So you can just use this in your analysis. Uh, obviously, spell checking, uh, trying different combinations of words, removing words that get repeated quite often and they do not much value, like he, she, and you, me. Um, there are other techniques that can help you to uh, decompress this huge matrix of all the possible words to a few explainable, to a few fewer, fewer dimensions. You can use something like uh, singular value decomposition to do this. Um, we could use something called word to vec uh, It's based on deep learning, and it tries to represent each word with a series of numbers in a way that you can do mathematical operations between words. So if from the word king, I subtract the word man, the closer result that comes out is the word queen. And I have seen it working this way. It doesn't always work so interestingly, uh, but... Um, it definitely, this representation can give you very good uh, insight about what a word is really about. It, therefore, it can give you features derived from this representation, uh, can help you uh, a lot in NLP problems. Um, other feature engineering is applied to time series data. Um, when, in the most simple form, you may just try to decompose the date. So which day of the month it is, which year, week day, week number, if it is a holiday. Uh, but quite often the features uh, get derived from the actual target variable uh, versus time. So I want to predict sales today. Can I use the sales yesterday or the sales two days ago as my features in order to predict sales today? So essentially lag one and lag two. Or I could even try to take aggregated measures or windows based on these lag values. 
for example, create a moving averages for the same periods. This is extremely basic. I'm only touching the surface here of what the software does, but this is just to give you a high level idea of the different features that the software will explore on trying to um, make better predictions for different problems. These are some of the packages that, that we use. These are not the only ones, but some of the most well-known ones. The key point here is that we obviously capitalize on our open source heritage, um, and we use many of our algorithms, but at the same time, we also use other open source tools which have done extremely well. They have won multiple awards, and uh, they have done also extremely well in a competitive context, like uh, LightGBM from Microsoft, uh, and Gradient, uh, and XGBoost for Gradient Boosting Applications, Random Forest from Scikit-Learn, um, get us uh, with a TensorFlow backend for our deep learning implementations. A lot of our data managing happens using SIP, NumPy, and Pandas, but we are also slowly transferring to data table. It's an open source tool. It's something that H2O develops. And uh, we think it's, it's, uh, it doesn't have the depth of Pandas yet in terms of functionality, but uh, it's extremely efficient and very quick, handles memory extremely well. Um, and supports mo most of the major operations. I advise you to have a look if you haven't tried it. It's available in R as well, so both Python and R. Uh, obviously, just picking a machine learning algorithm out of the box is not going to give you the best results. So all these algorithms are heavily parameterized. They contain a lot of hyperparameters that you need to tune in order to make them perform well for a, a specific problem. Consider an XGBoost algorithm, which is essentially um, a form of a weighted uh, random forest, uh, whereas in each tree you, you, you could control how deep you should make each tree, depth two, depth three, um, uh, what different loss functions you can use to expand your trees, or what should be the learning rate, how much each tree should rely on the previous one when it uh, gives you predictions, how many trees you should put in that uh, random forest. So, uh, and this is just some basic parameters that are a lot more, but in order to be able to get a good result, you need to find some good parameters uh, for these algorithms. And this is something that, uh, uh, driverless AI also does automatically, as well as uh, for any other feature transformation that you, you've seen. In order to make good decisions within driverless AI, we try to um, find internally a good way to test. We try to internally create a good testing environment so that we can try a lot of different things, a lot of different transformations and algorithms, and have the confidence that it will, they will work well in, in some uh, unobserved uh, data. So, for example, in a time series approach, most of the times where you know, time is very important, we will have, um, we always, we can use different variants, but the, the, the basic idea is that we always train on past data and we validate our models on future data. There can be various flavors to it. One we like to use a lot is a validation with uh, many moving windows or with a rolling windows where we will build multiple models on different periods, always sifting that validation window towards the past, the test window essentially towards the past, building models with any data you have before that as a way to make certain you have a model that can generalize well in any period. Um, when the data is essentially uh, uh, random in respect of time, um, we will most probably use a form of k-fold cross-validation where what this says is I'm going to divide, to separate my data, set in, my data set into k parts. It doesn't need to be sequential like what I have, but as is an example. And then for k times, you're going to take um, a part of the data, you're going to uh, fit an algorithm or try different hyperparameters, and then you're going to make predictions on that other part of the data and save the results, so how well you've done, for example, in terms of accuracy. And you will repeat this process having a different part of the data now 
uh, being as test or as, as holdout. And you repeat this process multiple times until essentially every part of your data has become holdout at some point, has become part of your test. And then you can get an aggregated metric for how well you've done. Uh, and then you can go to how good was that algorithm you use and how good were the hyperparameters you selected for that algorithm, as well as whether the feature transformations you've tried were, you know, were good enough. So how we decide on all of these things, because theoretically the, the, the type of combinations you can use for different algorithms, different features, uh, and different hyperparameters, you know, that space is really, really huge. So we have tried it, we found a way to um, optimize this through an evolutionary way in order to get some good results fairly quickly. And so just to give you, uh, I, I will go inside one driverless AI iteration and show you what it does in order to come up with good models and good, good features and good parameters. So imagine you have a data set, a very simple data set in this format, have four numerical features, one target where you try to predict. So what Dravelers will initially do is it will take these four features, it will decide on a cross-validation strategy based on the, normally the accuracy setting you set in the beginning, how much accuracy you want. And then it will pick an algorithm semi-randomly. It will put some initial parameters for this uh, algorithm. It will tune based on cross-validation those parameters a little bit. And then you will get an X percentage of accuracy based on this test framework, for example, this K-fold cross-validation. And this it will come back with a, with a ranking stating which features are the most important. Now, we can use this ranking in order to reinforce or make better decisions once we start the next iteration. For example, from this ranking, maybe I can infer that X1 feature doesn't seem to be so important. So going forward, I'm not going to spend so much time on it. However, X2 and X4 seem to be a little bit more promising. So once I start the second now iteration, I'm going to capitalize more on the features that seem to have more promise by either trying better individual transformations on them or even exploiting their interaction. But at the same time, I'm going to allow some room for random experimentation. I don't want to get trapped into this very directed approach of looking into the data. I want to always allow some room for searching in case I find some other interesting pattern. And the process continues uh, because I will pick an algorithm. It could be the same or a different one. Um, I will pick some parameters for these algorithms, which again, could be similar to the one before or different ones. I will slightly tune those parameters based on uh, the validation strategy we have selected. We will get a new percentage of accuracy and this will come back with a new rankings as to which features is, are most important. And this doesn't, um, and this is not only limited to features. This ranking goes to algorithms, goes to hyperparameters. So after a few runs, we have a good idea about what's working and what doesn't work, and always keep optimizing where we see essentially there is more juice. Again, always around, allowing for some room for uh, random experimentation. So is it an exploration, exploitation, optimization approach um, which has its um, roots on, on reinforcement learning? Um, I guess briefly I wanted to mention that maybe I'll skip this part, is we obviously use a lot of work in order to determine which features are the most important ones in your data. Maybe I can quickly mention it. Um, as you saw, there is always, our process always comes back with the ranking and the way we can understand how good a feature is and create this ranking is assuming I have a data set, I can split it in training and validation. I can fit an algorithm on my training data and with this fitted algorithm, I can make predictions trying to predict the target on the validation data. And that will give me an X percentage of accuracy, let's say it's 80% of accuracy. So what I can do next now is take that first column, that first feature in the validation data, 
and randomly shuffle it. So now I have one feature which is wrong in my data, and everything else is correct. So if now I repeat the scoring with the same algorithm, I'm expecting that the accuracy will drop. How much the accuracy dropped is essentially how important that feature was. And normally this ranking is very intuitive and is very powerful to understand really which features are the most important um, to include in your algorithms in order to get the best results. And then you essentially repeat this process for any other feature. So it's a good, a, a good quick way to understand which are the main key drivers for your data set. Um, then we use a process called stacking in order to try, because while all this process starts iteratively, we come up with various models and various transformations which could work well. So then Travelist has a process that tries to combine all of this, tries to find the best way to combine this in order to get the, the best result possible. And the process is, uh, on simple terms, imagine I have uh, three data sets, A, B, and C, uh, A could be my training data set, B is my validation data set, and C is the data set where I want to eventually make predictions for the test data set. So what I can do is take an algorithm, fit it on the training data set, and then make predictions for data set B and data set C, and save these predictions into new data sets. And I can continue this with another algorithm as well. I can pick a different algorithm. Again, I can fit on data set A, make predictions on B and C at the same time. I can stack these predictions on these newly created data sets. And I can repeat doing that until essentially I have a data set which consists of predictions of multiple different algorithms. And now I can use this target of the validation data set to, f to use another algorithm and find the best way to combine all these models, all these different algorithms uh, I use. So we can essentially pick one new algorithm to fit on this P1 data set uh, and find the best way to combine essentially the, all the different algorithms in order to give a final prediction for the test data set. This is normally a, a good approach called stacking or stack generalization. Um, implemented by Walbert in, in um, 1992 um, and normally can drive predictions, uh, can give you a good boost. And the last part before I uh, pass over to my colleague um, or maybe before the break is uh, machine learning interpretability. Um, this is a very important process for us because it can promote uh, accountability and bridge the gap between the black box models and something where people can feel comfortable uh, and understand. I think there are two main approaches colliding, if I can use this term. So there is the approach that says, I want to have something which is 100% interpretable. For example, I look at my data, and if uh, some everybody who's less than 30 years old has a 30% chance to default on his or her credit card payment, but uh, everyone who's more than 30 years old has less chance to default, maybe 20%. That is my model. So that this is the model I want to put in production. I've measured these values based on historical data. I'm 100% certain on how it works. So there is you know, clear accountability, but probably I can get much better accuracy if I combine more features, make something a little bit more complicated that can search for deeper patterns within the data. Um, uh, but obviously I, will n I cannot have exact explanation of how it works. So what we do is, uh, we use approximate explanations. The idea is you have the predictions of your complicated model, your, in this case, the driverless AI model, and you try to predict it with a simpler model. So you use a simpler model in order to understand the complicated model. And that simpler model could be a regression model or a decision tree, which approximately can give you an understanding of how the complicated model works. And, um, 
uh, and you can build different region codes and representations that can help you uh, understand on, on, on not only on a global level, but even at a per row, per sample basis, why a case have been scored like this. For example, this case had 70% chance to, to default, 30% because he or she missed a payment last month, add 20% more because he or she missed a payment two months ago, add a little bit more because he's too young, uh, etc. cetera. So uh, using these approaches, which call essentially surrogate models, um, you can get to an understanding of how the complicated models work and get very good um, insight about how the predictions are, are made uh, on a global as well as local perot level. And the nice thing about driverless is that once it has built all this pipeline of transforming the features, building the different algorithms, combining them, you can get different artifacts. Um, some, uh, one is based on Python, another one is based in Java called the Mojo, where you can put it in production and do the scoring through them. Um, and yeah, this is what I basically I wanted to say. Happy to take any questions if you'd like to connect. These are my details. And thank you for the opportunity you gave me to, to present to you. There's another question so there. will Go this tool it. negate or at least dilute the need for Kaggle competitions? I don't think so because, you know, once you raise the bar, um, you know, people can get to the next uh, uh, to the next stage, and I also think it can push it even more, which is good. Uh, but uh, I think at the same time there are various elements of these competitions where uh, a tool like driverless AI would have uh, disadvantages, and I'm saying this because this is a tool which is made to be production ready. For example, it does not look at the test data in order to improve the model. So because in, in, in a real world situation, you might only have training data. You never know when your test data might come in the future. For example, this is something that Kaglers use to their advantage. So they will see the structure of the test data, which they have it already in advance in order to be able to get a better score. You can draw all sorts. So, um, you know, Kaggle is, is slightly, what I'm trying to say is a little bit of a different, of a different world. It's amazing that we have been able to do so well, even given these uh, disadvantages against competitors. Um, uh, but no, I think, as I said, you raise the bar and people can push it even further, which is good. <laughs> um, if you need to carefully format data before passing to H2O, is there any help available as to the best transforms to apply to improve accuracy? In principle, we like the data in raw format as long as they are in tabular format. And that's because we can iterate, we, can, we iterate through different transformations and try to find the best. For example, you have a categorical feature and you decide to put it in as multiple dummy variables, but there might have been another transformation which could have worked better. So actually we prefer people not to do much cleaning. Now there might be some special cases, particularly on time series, for example, where a certain pre-processing of the data might actually help uh, but I think that's that's quite of a of a bigger discussion. Um, in principle, we like the data in raw format. We are comfortable with working with missing values and, and unstructured data, um, as in text, uh, and find good representations for them. Um, I've got a question that I can answer for. Out of all those, there's the, uh, that top ahead. one. I could save give Marius a rest on his voice. Uh -huh. So, is it flexible with different cloud solutions? So driverless AI is available on all the major cloud uh, environments. So uh, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, and Amazon Web Services, it's available on there um, within the marketplace. Um, so feel free to go, go there. 
What we also do is um, there's the learning environment that we encourage you to utilize, which we'll be using uh, for this particular training, um, something called Aquarium. So the great thing about driverless technology is you can get up and running with it in a matter of minutes because of those cloud formations that we um, are installed on. Do you want to take the next one, Marius? Okay, that, no more rest for me. <laughs> <laughs> so does travelers provide an opportunity to manually set or restrict a list of models we want to go with for the experiment? Absolutely. Absolutely. Driverless can give you full control of the parameters you want to set, the, the models you want to try, the, fit, the different feature transformations you might want to block or allow. So if you wanted to have some control, you can still have it. And with our next version, you should also have the, uh, which is coming soon, this month, you should also have the option to add your own models, your own feature transformations, your own metrics. You have, uh, through Python, um, you have the options to do all of these things. And yeah, if you wanted to have, um, you know, the control, you know, we can expose the will. We, uh, we are happy to do that. That the, the next question on in terms of how proactively do we accommodate open source updates, as, as Marius uh, described, driverless AI sits on top of a number of open source packages. And when driverless AI gets installed, um, then those packages automatically get updated. So every iteration of the product would automatically have those open source packages um, available to them. One other point that I want to really highlight that, that Marius talked about is H2O, when building products, is utilizing the open source community. But what we also want to do as an organization is to give back to the open source community as well. So a really great example of that was when Marius talked about the data.table that's now av available within Python. So that was a package that was available in R. Um, we felt that to accelerate uh, driverless AI's data preparation capabilities, we needed something that was better than uh, pandas behind the back end and felt that data.table package, if it was in Python, would help accelerate driverless AI. But rather than just take that out of the R world and uh, turn that into something that was proprietary for H2O and driverless, we said, well, let's put that package back into the open source world. But there's no point putting it back into the R open source world because it already existed in there. So what we've done is to create it, utilize it as part of driverless AI, but give it back to the community. So you can utilize data.table in your Python workflows. As Marius said, it hasn't got all the bells and whistles at the moment of other data manipulation uh, frameworks within Python, but we are continually developing that um, and we'll t continually add uh, to that into uh, the open source community. So I just wanted to add that as a point of, to really emphasize that first phrase that Marius talks about where H2O's mission is to democratize AI. It's to create tools, uh, whether they be open source or commercial software, to accelerate that process, but also give back to the community as well. So I guess we have one more question. What maturity level is driverless car models at currently? I have to say, although we are called driverless, we driverless cars is not necessarily our, our specialty. Uh, we haven't worked on this problem, but based on, on reports I've seen, performance was actually very good. It seems that we can already achieve better than humans performance in terms of fewer accidents at least. Um, the problem is, and I think this is where the process stuck at the moment, is there was, there was an accident and then there is the, the problem of accountability. Who is at fault and, and why the, the accident happened? Where this is a thing we need to work a little bit on to be able to fully integrate such an AI within society. And that's why I also highlighted the importance of interpretability. Something, you know, as a company we've taken obviously very seriously. 
Okay, so that, if there's no more questions for anyone, that takes us nicely on to um, a break. So what we will do is have a break for 15, 20 minutes, refuel. Um, there's some pizzas downstairs, I believe. Um, so feel free to grab some pizzas. Don't eat too much because I don't want to have that dreaded grave shift, graveyard shift where everyone comes back and then feels very sleepy. But go down, have some pizzas, we'll come back, we'll start to explore the product and get hands on, looking at all the concepts that Marius has talked about and how those are integrated into the tool. <laughs>